Hello and welcome to Financial Markets Microstructure. This is lecture number two. In previous class, we did an introduction to the course. We saw what this course is approximately about and introduced some of the core concepts and language that we will be using throughout the course. Finally, we have also talked a little bit about the institutions, about how real-world markets are organized, what are the possible types of markets and uh, dimensions in which they can differ. And we also introduced uh, the, mo the main players in the markets. Today we will be talking about the ephemeral concept that we call liquidity. We will discuss what it is, we will talk about how we can measure it, and uh, well, to be honest, most of today's lecture will be devoted to the problems of measuring liquidity and dealing with the problems that arise during this process. How to deal with the missing data and how to uh, go along with the data that you have. So let us begin by talking about what actually is liquidity. Now what we mean most of the time when we say liquidity in this course is market liquidity. And to give you a book definition, it is a market's ability to facilitate an asset being sold quickly without having to reduce its price very much or even at all. Now, as you can see, this definition is a little bit vague. It does not, it does not tell us what quickly means. It does not tell us what very much means and so on. But you get the spirit of this definition. So market liquidity is a feature of the market. It tells us how easy it is to trade in the market, to buy or sell anything in this given market. Now there are two other kinds of liquidity which are somewhat related to market liquidity and we will be alluding to these types of liquidity throughout the course. So let us introduce those as well. Now let us start with the latter one. Monetary liquidity is the assets ability to be exchanged for goods. So it is almost the same thing as market liquidity, but instead this uh, is a property of a given asset rather than the property of a market. So for example, if we talk about not financial markets but market for um, markets for cars versus market for ice cream. You would think that cars are in general a much less liquid asset, so it's more difficult to buy or sell a car in general. It's more difficult than trying to buy or sell an ice cream. On the other hand, if we focus on markets for cars, then the liquidity of um, market for cars in Chicago is a lot greater than liquidity of a market for cars in um, the middle of Nebraska. Right, so the same asset can have different liquidity in different markets, but it is obvious that different assets also have different um, levels of liquidity. Now the final type of liquidity that we're going to talk about is funding liquidity. And this is the economic agent's ability to obtain cash or credit at acceptable terms or to meet obligations without incurring large losses. So this is the property of economic agents rather than the property of a market or the property of an asset. Funding liquidity has to do with the fact that even if you have a lot of assets the composition of your portfolio of assets may be such that it is not easy to liquidate these assets when you need money. So, for example, banks are quite often a good example of that. Because the way banks work is they give out loans and they take in the deposits. The loans that they give out are their assets. This is their wealth. This is the money they own 
But this is the money that they do not have immediately. This is the money that they will eventually get from borrowers. But this also means is that if a bank is hit by a liquidity shock, for example, many people come simultaneously to uh, withdraw their deposits, then the bank has a um, funding liquidity crisis. Because banks have these assets, but they cannot convert them into cash to meet their immediate liabilities. Another simple example is uh, if your wage arrives in two days, but your rent is due today, then you can say that you are liquidity constrained. Because you have the money, if you trust your employer to pay you in two days, but you do not have access to this money today. You, do not, you cannot convert your wealth into liquid assets. So as you see, all three types of liquidity are quite interconnected. But the main difference between them is that they relate to different entities, different aspects of the transaction. Okay, so this is what liquidity is. Liquidity measures how easy it is to convert an asset into, well, basically money. You can come up with a fancier uh, definition of money, such as the most liquid uh, asset or numerator good, but really we are talking about money. So why do we care about liquidity, especially we as researchers? Well, let me take a small detour here and talk about efficiency instead. And let me depart from slides and draw you a small graph that you have seen many times in your introduction to economics class. So if this is quantity on the horizontal axis and price on the vertical axis, and we're looking at some market of some good. Oh, sorry, I forgot to zoom out. We're looking at some market of some good. Uh, and we abstract away from the details. In this market, you have some demand curve usually called D, and you have some supply curve given by S. And think for now that these curves are composed of many different people who are willing to buy or sell the asset respectively, and each of these people have um, wants to buy or sell one unit of the asset, but they have different willingnesses to pay on the demand side, and different reservation prices on the supply side. So for example, on the supply side, if say this is phi, then the supply curve tells us that the fifth lowest price that anyone on the, sell, on the supply side is willing to accept to part with their product is this high, is at this level. And the same for the demand curve. So the fifth highest price that anyone is willing to pay for the asset is this high. Now, what happens in classical markets that you saw in introduction to economics? You say that there is this equilibrium price, P, at which demand and supply are equalized, and this is the price that is established in the equilibrium. So what does happen at this price? At this price, all sellers who value their items below this price, so these guys, part with their items and sell these items to people on the demand side who value these items higher than this uh, equilibrium price. So these guys. 
being that in the end, people with highest valuations for the asset, so only the top bars of demand supply curve, end up having the assets. So all assets in the economy are reallocated to whoever values them most. And this is what we call the efficient allocation. This is what this is the goal that markets are meant to achieve. Now, what happens when market is illiquid? Recall the original definition. Market is illiquid if it is not easy to sell or buy the item without uh, dropping or without dropping its price very much or without paying extra. So if market is illiquid, then there are actually two prices in the market. Buyers have to pay more uh, to get the asset, while the sellers can get less if they sell the asset. What does this mean for our market efficiency? It means that, well, these sellers will part with their uh, will part with their items, and they will sell these items to these buyers, right? So, still, all trade that happens is efficient. But we now have some trade or some possible trades that would have been efficient to make but that were not made. So in the end we get an allocation in which these buyers and these sellers have the items. So we have some inefficient holdings in equilibrium. Or the allocation that is established in this illiquid market is inefficient. Which means that illiquidity is a barrier to efficiency. And this is why we do not like liquidity. Markets are meant to bring us to the efficient allocation. But if markets are illiquid, they cannot do this. This was the message of this slide. So illiquidity leads to inefficiency. And this is why we as researchers of markets care about liquidity. But what about the agents who are directly participating in the market? What does illiquidity mean for them? Well, first of all, traders themselves care about liquidity because it gives them a measure of their trading costs. Recall that we directly said that liquidity measures how much you need to drop the price to sell the asset or how much extra you need to pay in order to get the asset. So this is the trading costs. Illiquidity measures trading costs compared to the efficient market price. For regulators, on the other hand, there are many ways in which liquidity is relevant. Firstly, Regulators care about the efficiency of the markets, right? We have markets in the society in order to arrive to the efficient allocations, but if markets are illiquid, then we cannot get to efficiency. But the actual efficiency of the markets is quite often tricky to measure. So it is hard to say whether a given allocation in the market in the society is efficient or not. And this is when liquidity helps, because liquidity is easier to measure, as we will see further today, and it provides a proxy measure for efficiency. So if you see a market that is illiquid, then as we just discussed, it implies that the market is likely inefficient. And we can reduce the inefficiency in that market by reducing the illiquidity in this market. Secondly, Regulators care about market stability. And this is also a goal that conflicts with illiquidity, because illiquid markets are generally often more prone to medium-run price deviations from the fundamentals, from the fair price that uh, should be established in the market, from the efficient price that would have established in a perfectly liquid market. So not only the deviations from the market, uh, from this fundamental price, 
are large under illiquidity, but they are also more volatile. And this is something that we would like to eliminate. Finally, illiquidity may be a sign of structural problems in the market. So, illiquidity can be seen as a call to action for regulators to change something in the market, to reduce this illiquidity, to reduce the inefficiencies. Finally, one other concept that I would like to talk about while talking about liquidity is market depth. Depth measures how much must be traded to move price by a certain amount. So you can see it as uh, the sensitivity of liquidity to trade size, right? For example, the market might be liquid for small amounts. If, if I want to buy or sell uh, one piece of ice cream, one uh, cone, then it might be easy for me to do so. But if I have a full ship loaded with cones of ice cream, it is definitely a lot more difficult for me to trade this, to trade this amount. So market depth measures how much more difficult it is to sell a whole shipload worth of snow cones versus one snow, snow cone. Now, I will be a little inconsistent in general on whether depth relates to liquidity or whether depth is a part of a general concept of liquidity. So I will go a little bit back and forth and I beg your pardon for that in advance, but either way it is a very, very close concept. Moving on, another thing I want to say about liquidity is that it is not constant over time. Liquidity changes over time, and in particular, liquidity can dry up in the face of adversity. So whenever something bad happens in the world, liquidity can typically dry out. And these graphs exemplify this using the 2008 uh, crisis that jump-started the Great Recession. There are three different graphs here. The first graph shows the sovereign bond uh, BDESC spreads in the US and in Europe, and we are interested in the US graph. So sovereign bonds are bonds issued by the government to borrow from the populace and from the firms. And you can see that the spread for the sovereign bonds has increased drastically after uh, the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, which is marked by the vertical black line. So liquidity had, had had a sudden negative shock and quite significant at that. Uh, the second graph exemplifies the same using the average transaction size as a liquidity measure. Here uh, the vertical line is actually in the wrong place. It should be one year before in the middle of 2008. And we should look at the uh, red graph which shows the average transaction size for US sovereign bonds. You can see that it also dropped quite significantly. Finally, uh, price impact coefficients are represented on the third graph, and you can see that all of those also increased. So price became more sensitive to quantities, and market depth also increased. Sorry, market depth has decreased as a result of that um, event, as did liquidity. In general, we would probably want markets to be more efficient in crisis times, not less, because this is when assets need to change hands the most, because this is when economic agents valuations for the assets change the most and change quickly. So even if we can tolerate liquidity changing over time, we want it to change in the opposite direction. We want markets to be more liquid in crisis times than in uh, peaceful times. Now that we have some idea of what liquidity is and how it behaves, let us take a look at how to measure liquidity.
and what measures there are for doing so. We will look at quite a few of those and this slide gives you a quick summary, a quick spoiler for what is to happen. Uh, in particular we will look at a few spread measures and this will be the our main class of measures that we will be using throughout uh, the rest of the course. We will be looking at price measures such as volume weighted average price, we will look at price impact measures and we will uh, quickly talk about some non-trading measures such as trading volumes. We will also uh, talk a little bit about how to behave uh, when you are missing some of the data required to estimate some of these measures. But all in its due time. Another uh, looking forward is that we will be immediately applying all of our knowledge to one example data set. So this is the data set uh, that accompanies the textbook. Once again we are following textbook by Foucault, Pagano and uh, Royle. Excuse me, I still don't know how to pronounce the surname correctly. And you can find the textbook, uh, you can find the data set on the textbook's companion website. So this data set uh, in general tracks or gives you data on one trading day in Krispy Kreme stock. Krispy Kreme is a coffee and donut franchise company similar to Dunkin Donuts if you do not know that. So this data set has all transactions from one trading day and we will be playing around with the first 30 transactions and the whole data set has about a thousand I believe. Now this is how the data um, not looks like but this is how the data can be represented. We have bid prices, we have ask prices at the time of every transaction, we have uh, the actual transaction prices and we have the directions. So we know who, initial, uh, who initialized, yes let's say who initialized the trade, um, initiated the trade, sorry that's the word I was looking for. So whether it was initiated by the buyer or a seller. Now a few things to point out about this graph. Firstly you can notice that the price is sometimes inside the spread. So when the prices are exactly at the bid and ask prices it is easy to guess that well you know there was a bid price and there was an ask price and the trader just came and decided to trade at that bid and ask price. But what does it mean for prices to be inside the spread? Well it means one of the two things. Firstly it might think that there were hidden limit orders in the market and we discussed last week in the previous class, in the previous lecture, what hidden limit orders are and how they work. But the idea is that hidden limit orders could be, could be offering better prices than the visible limit orders and if a market order arrives then it could hit a hidden limit order. Another option is there is a dealer in the market and the dealer offers price improvements to traders. So the dealer basically says well there are bid and ask prices that can be um, used by anyone who arrives but if I see a trader that I particularly like and whom I've been trading with for the past 20 years I can offer them an individual price improvement. I can offer them a better price to trade at. And so you can see this happens quite a lot. So maybe not all of these are price improvements but some of them could be. Another thing about this graph is that there is one price here, this one, that is outside the spread. And this is actually much easier to explain. These bid and ask prices are the best prices available in the market but they are only valid for a limited uh, quantity, for a limited trade size. So if a trader arrives in the market and they want to trade more than the best uh, limit order currently offers, then the trader would have to go deeper into the book 
and fully exhaust the best quote and then uh, go deeper to second best quote and uh, and so on if they want to trade a lot so this is the data set we will be playing with and now let us uh, actually get to the measures the first one that we will consider is the simplest one and this is just the quoted spread if you recall the graph I told you that the illiquid market features two prices instead of one we have an ask price and a bid price and everything just stems from that they lead to inefficiency they are the manifestation of illiquidity so why do we not just use these two prices to say that well this is the degree of illiquidity in the market in particular we can just calculate the quoted spread at any given time and this quoted spread capital st is just equal to the difference between the ask and the bid prices so ask price is the price at which you can buy the asset bid price is the price at which you can sell the asset well this is all good and nice but if I for example tell you that the quoted spread on Microsoft stock is currently at one dollar is that a lot or not how should we treat this absolute number well the answer is we cannot but it makes a lot more sense to talk about the relative spread the normalized spread because the one dollar spread means very different things when we're talking about the uh, stock which is valued at a hundred dollars because then it's just a one percent spread versus when we're talking about the stock which is worth ten dollars because then we have a 10 percentage point spread so we can do this by calculating the normalized quoted spread we'll call it small st and we can just uh, obtain it by taking the absolute spread capital st and divide it by the mid quote by the average price at which uh, the asset is currently quoted so it's just the average between the ask price and the bid price And if you are concerned that this is uh, that this spread only accounts for the best quotes, and we do not know what what their sizes are, how many units they are valid for, then you can generalize this measure for any given trade size Q. So, you, given the whole limit order book, if you know all the quotes at all times, then you can compute what would be the price at which you can buy the asset buy Q units of the asset at any given time and the price at which you can sell Q units of the asset at any given time and those would be the average ask and bid prices respectively and so you can compute the quoted spread for any trade size Q if we apply this measure to our example then you will get a graph something like this ignore the ticks uh, we look at the purple line so the purple line is the normalized quoted spread with the y-axis the with the scale on the right uh, y-axis and you can immediately see what is wrong with this measure so you can see that the quoted spread around the first transactions was really huge but if you go back and look at the actual prices at which those transactions took place you see that things were not actually that bad because these uh, trades received price improvements so maybe the market was not as illiquid as this quoted spread makes it seem so how can we leverage that information we can do that by looking at effective spread an effective spread will not be a forward-looking measure so it is not a measure of um, what is the price at which I, I can trade going forward but it is rather a backward looking measure so it says what was the trading cost faced by the previous trader so if we say that one market order is executed per period 
and we denote the trade direction by dt. So it'll be 1 or minus 1, and we'll say the direction is equal to 1 if the trade was initiated by the buyer, and minus 1 if it was initiated by the seller. And we'll call pt the realized transaction price. Then we'll say that the effective half spread is equal to uh, capital S T with uh, E superscript, and it is equal to the distance between the realized price and the mid quote in the market at that given time. And we use DT to have uh, the spread always being positive, or at least probably positive. So to normalize the sign. Uh, similarly, you can obtain the relative effective half spread or normalized effective half spread. So the idea behind this measure is that it compares the actual price with the midquote the instant before. And um, by using the actual price data from the transactions that took place, this measure does capture all the price improvements uh, that we had in the market. The Another feature, which can be good or bad depending on your goals and purposes, is that this measure does uh, capture price impact. So the fact that it uses the realized prices means that this measure takes into account the trade sizes. So if there was a really large trade which took uh, place at a price which was deviating very heavily from the midquote, the effective spread will tell you that the market was very illiquid at that given point in time. However, in reality, the market was not illiquid. The market could have been liquid, but this effective spread was caused by actually the large uh, trade size. So, limited depth was the cause of the measured uh, large effective spread. Going back to our example, if we estimate uh, the sp effective spread together with the normalized spread, and uh, we'll say that both of these are half spreads, so, so that they are comparable, we'll get a graph like this. So here blue, green is the normalized quoted half spread, our first measure, and the blue is the normalized effective spread, so the measure we've just seen. And you can see that since it captures price improvements, it does not have this outlier for the first three transactions. And so the spread is actually a lot more uniform. Furthermore, the effective spread is generally lower because it captures price improvements, but it's lower for the... it's higher than the quoted spread for this one transaction because it captures also the price impact of large trades. The third and final price measure is given by the realized spread. And it captures the trading cost, not the trading cost per se, but it measures the cost of taking a given position in the asset. So it is a spread realized by somebody who holds the asset for some number of periods. And we counted, we calculate this in a way that's very similar to the effective spread, except we use the mid quote with a delay. So instead of MT, we use MT plus delta. Oh, I did not mean to do that. The idea here is to measure the spread after prices have adjusted to new information. So, in the effective spread, you compare the trade price with quotes available at that time. But in reality, with the realized spread, price, uh, trades themselves move future quotes and future prices. So this measure is meant to capture that. Now, if you try to apply it as a forward-looking measure, 
then you will typically get the same thing as an effective spread. Because the expectation of a future mid-quote is typically the same thing as the current mid-quote. But if you use it as a backward-looking measure, which is a more reasonable way to use it, to apply it, then you will find that this is typically smaller than the effective spread. This happens exactly because prices react to transactions. So, no, we cannot see it from this graph. But if you think about it, if a somebody came to the market today and wanted to buy the asset, right? They will buy the asset at the ask price, which is higher than the mid-quote. So they will overpay a little bit. But who does this money go to? Well, you think it goes to the intermediary, to the dealer. So is this discrepancy between the ask price and the mid-quote, is it the dealer's profit? Does it all get pocketed? by the market maker? The answer is not really. Because the market maker can can then not sell the asset at this mid-quote. So this mid-quote does not represent the dealer's value for the asset. Because going forward, the prices will adapt. The market will make inferences, and the dealer himself will make inferences from the fact that somebody wanted to buy the asset. And as we will see later, but hopefully as is intuitive now, if somebody wanted to buy the asset, then it might be possible that they have some information that the asset is currently underpriced. So that the asset is worth more than the prices currently suggest. This will create an upward pressure on prices and simply depleting the limit order book on the buy side will also create an upward pressure on prices. Meaning that after somebody came to the market and wanted to buy the asset, the future prices will increase. So the dealer who sold the asset today at a high price will need to close that position and buy, rebuy the asset back in the future. They will have to pay more in the future to repay this asset. So they do not get to enjoy all of the profit that stemmed from the half spread that they realized due to this price effect on future trades. And this long explanation was meant to tell you why realized spread will typically be lower than the effective spread. And this is something that we do observe in our toy example for the most part. Here we arbitrarily take delta equal to 5, meaning that we assume that the dealers uh, hold the asset for 5 transactions, which is completely arbitrary number, and you can choose any other number in your calculations if you decide to replicate um, my calculations. In this particular example, the realized spread will also even be negative sometimes, meaning that the dealer will realize a loss sometimes. But this is not something that we should stop on in great detail. So related to what I just told you about, the quoted spread and the effective spread are more useful to the traders in the market because they measure the trading costs. Quoted spread measures the trading costs uh, looking forward. So what is the trading cost uh, that I encounter if I decide to trade now? While the effective spread is the backward-looking measure of trading costs. So what was the trading cost faced by the last trader, by the previous trader? On the other hand, the realized spread is actually more relevant to the dealer, to the market maker, for exactly the reasons that I just told you about. So you can think of the dealer as the one holding the asset. In the real world, these intermediaries, the market makers, they aim to have zero inventory on average in the long run. 
but the need for these intermediaries comes exactly from the fact that trade flows are imbalanced over time. That in a given second there are more buy orders than sell orders, and in another second the opposite is true. So the dealers do have to hold some inventory in the short run. And the realized spread is one possible measure of how costly it is for them to hold this inventory. Or I guess the realized spread itself measures the profit. But this realized spread may be negative, in which case it will be the cost of holding the asset. So we have introduced a few measures, mostly related to the spread. Well, all of them related to the spread so far. And these measures, we will introduce some more measures later. But now let us talk some more about these. They require quite a bit of data. So if we look at one of the expressions that we had, for example, for the realized spread, what kind of data do we need to correctly estimate this realized spread? We need the price on the directions of trade. Sorry, we need data on the directions of trade. We need data on the realized prices of the transactions. And we need the quote data to calculate the mid quote. It is not often the case, it is not always the case that you have access to all of this data. So let us look at what can you do if you are missing some. Let us begin by the case in which you can only observe quotes and the realized trade prices, but you do not have access to data on the direction of trade. So you see the, the price at which the deal took place, but you do not know how this deal happened. Was it because a market order to buy hit a limit order to sell or vice versa? So how can we classify these trades? How can we fill in this missing data on the direction of trade? Well, as I told at the very beginning, if trading takes place at the ask or bid quotes, it is relatively easy to guess which, which, who initiated that trade. If the trade takes place outside the spread, then the same applies. It is even easier, but uh, the trade, uh, the, the price that the trader got was worse due to limited price, uh, due, to, due to limited market depth. But the complications arise when trading is within the quotes, when there are either price improvements or hidden limit orders, in which case it's not obvious who initiated the, tr who initiated the trade. And that's what Lee and Reedy uh, decided to fix in their 1991 paper, in which they proposed a very simple but effective algorithm. This algorithm says, well, if the realized trade price is closer to the ask price that was offered in the market at that time, then you say that it was actually a buyer-initiated trade. While if the realized price is closer to the bid quote, which is the second case, then it is a seller-initiated trade. In the unlikely case when uh, the price is exactly at the mid quote, you can look at the direction of prices. So if price went up compared to the previous transaction, then you say it was a buyer initiated trade, and vice versa if the price went down, then it was a seller initiated trade. So very simple and straightforward algorithm. Let us see how it performs in our example. So suppose we did not have any data on the trade direction, but we still observe the realized prices and we observe the quotes to calculate the mid quote, the solid black line. So what you do is you basically take all trades under the mid quote, whose realized prices were under the mid quote, and you say that these were seller initiated. And vice versa, all trades was with the realized prices above mid quotes at those times are buyer initiated. So you will get something like this. We could classify most of our trades, but there are three left 
with prices exactly at the mid quote. The second rule, which meant to look at price dynamics, uh, is actually only useful in one of these three cases, in particular in this one. Because here the price went down compared to the previous transaction, so we are saying that this is a seller-initiated trade. In the other two cases, here, uh, the price of this unclassified trade exactly coincides with the price of, that the previous trade took place at. So we will just say that inertia is in order and the type of this trade, the unclassified trade, is exactly the same as that of a previous trade, which is a reasonable assumption. So we arrived at this classification and if we compare it to the actual data that we have, we will see that we only made one mistake with this trade on the mid quote. Now this is of course a very uh, weak test and very weak evidence that Lee Reedy actually classifies the trades correctly. But fortunately there were other researchers that did a more thorough test. So Otters in White in 2000 tested uh, Lee and Reedy algorithm not on 30 transactions as we just did, but on a data set with over 400,000 transactions from the New York Stock Exchange. If I remember correctly, which I do not, uh, I believe they have all the data from New York Stock Exchange for over three months or around that. So they take all that huge array of data and they test Lee Reedy algorithm and they see that um, it performs okay. So it was about, it was able to correctly classify trades in about 85% um, of cases, 85% of trades, which may seem high, but is actually not that high if you recall that random guessing would give you 50% correct rate. So Lear Reedy algorithm improves upon random guessing to some extent, but there are still a ways to go. The trades that the algorithm struggles the most are trades at the midpoint, the small transactions, and transactions in um, very liquid, frequently traded stocks, so stocks with large capitalization. And you can see the intuition behind all of these, right? So trades at the midpoint are those where we have the most uncertainty, right? Small transactions are also likely to happen at <clears throat> excuse me, to happen at prices which are close to the mid quote. Finally, Ill, uh, sorry, very liquid stocks have very small spreads and uh, equivalently all trades happen at prices very close to the mid quote. So it is again more difficult to classify those correctly. And the chance to make a mistake is a lot higher. So, it's not the best thing since sliced bread, but if you are missing data on uh, directions of trade and you need the data to use one of the spread measures or for any other purpose, then this is one algorithm that you can use to try to fill in those blanks. Now let us go further and talk about what you can do if you do not even have the quote data. Recall the holy trinity that we had. You need price data on a realized transaction prices, you need quote data and you need direction of trade data. We talked what happens if you don't have data on direction of trade. Now let's say what you can do if you don't have the data on quotes. How can you estimate the spread if you cannot observe the spread? Here, a popular way to go is to use the roll measure from 1984, which builds a simple model. This paper builds a simple model that allows you to estimate the spread without actually knowing the quotes. 
and it only uses data on transaction prices so you can compute it with very weak data transaction price data is the one that's most that's one that's easiest to obtain so how does this magic work now there is a model and the model is very stylized which means it has a lot of different assumptions which are not necessarily always true so the model assumes that all trades have the same size and we'll call directions by d1 and d minus 1 but you do not need to observe directions in the data these are just directions in the model we say that all arriving orders are either a buy or a sell with a 50 50 percent chance so the direction of trade of the arriving order is uh, random and we assume that mid quote follows a random walk meaning that the mid quote at time t is given by the previous mid quote plus some innovation term epsilon t and these epsilons are identically and independently distributed so they are the price shocks the very important and possibly somewhat questionable assumption is that market orders are not informative so in every period you obtain 50 50 percent chance to get a buy or a sell order and these probabilities do not depend on any way on how the price moves on how the mid quote moved and how the mid quote will move so market orders do not have any price impact and they are not reactive to prices in turn finally the model assumes that this bid ask spread is constant it does not change over time which may be not a very bad assumption if you're looking at a very um, short run data it's a very micro level data so under these assumptions you can write transaction price pt as the mid quote plus a half spread with a sign dependent on trade size so if it's a buy it's mid quote plus half spread if uh, it's a sell then the price is mid quote minus a half spread so here we know the transaction price but we do not know the mid quote and we actually do not even know the direction of trade otherwise things would be really simple how do we estimate the spread yes the very smart idea in the rolls paper is that even though orders are and price shocks are identically and independently distributed over time the directions of trade and the transaction prices are mean reverting so basically if you had a or market order to buy today then the price is high today let me let me try to draw this on the graph why does this keep happening excuse me for some reason I consistently captured their own window so suppose that pink color this is our mid quote through time so our x-axis is time t and in this particular example and very scribbly graph the mid quote is just one constant for simplicity then ask prices will always be half spread above the mid quote so also constant and the bid quotes will always be half spread below the mid quote so suppose that somebody came at this time in period one for example and wanted to buy the asset so they hit the ask price right what can happen in period two what can the next orders price be well it either stays the same 
if the next order is also a buy order or the next order decides to sell in which case the price goes down right so you can see if the ask price was above the mid quote then on average it will go down in the next period and vice versa if in period one we had a sell order the transaction price would be bt so the next period price would on average be higher so you see the prices are pressured to return to the mid quote to mt And this is basically what happens in our own model. So the covariance between changes in the direction of trade will be negative, which is something that you can compute. I had a blank here in the slide because it derived it on the board. And um, I guess I will not derive it right now, but this is something you can do. So if you plug in all of these um, directions of trade in here no, okay let's let's do it it's difficult to explain without it without actually doing them why do my windows not capture like this so what we want to compute is a covariance between delta dt and delta d t minus 1 which if we uh, write out the differences explicitly will look like covariance between dt minus dt minus 1 and happened and dt minus 1 minus dt minus 2 now covariance is a linear operator meaning that you can actually open these brackets so you have covariance of difference with a difference and it will be equal to covariance of dt with dt minus 1 minus covariance of dt minus 1 with dt minus 1 minus covariance of dt and dt minus 2 minus times minus plus covariance of dt minus 1 plus dt minus 2 I will not be writing that out explicitly but if you recall directions of trade are independently and identically distributed meaning that covariances of uh, directions of trade from different periods are zero they are independent from one another so the only term we will have left is actually that in which we take covariance between the directions of trade from the same period and obviously covariance of this is equal to just variance of dt minus 1 which in our case is equal to 1. So in the end we get that covariance between changes in directions of trade is equal to minus 1. So directions of trade are mean reverting. If you had a buy today, you on average will get a sell tomorrow. Even though this is not formally true. Um, now scratch that. I did not just say that. So yes, the slide actually provides a good enough intuition. If we had a positive change in DT today, it means that we went from a sale to a buy. So the next change will be either zero, if we go from a buy to a buy, or the next change will be negative if we go to, from a buy to a sell. So we can then work out the covariance between changes in prices. 
And we can do it in the same way if we just plug in the the expressions for prices in terms of directions of trade that we had. And the negative covariance in changes in directions of trade is exactly what will give us the negative covariance in changes in prices over time. So if you calculate that, you will obtain that this covariance will be equal to minus squared spread over 4. And this covariance is actually something that you can compute from the data. Which means that you can estimate the spread by estimating this covariance of price changes. And this is the how the expression looks like if we express the spread through everything else. So this is a very nice and elegant estimator which allows you to estimate the spread under knowledge of only prices and nothing else. And this estimator results from a very simple model. Now, in principle, you can argue that this model, that this model can be extended in many different ways. And the textbook actually works out some of the extensions. And in principle, roll measure can be adapted to account to can be adapted to the relaxed model in which one of the crucial assumptions that we made here are relaxed. But then of course you will not have the same expression for the spread, you will have a slightly different estimator. So in our very simple example, if you decide to estimate the spread from uh, rolls measure, you will obtain uh, 0 0.01, so one basis point. And uh, if we go back and look at the actual spread estimators, you see that it is not that far. So our half spreads were pretty much between 0 and one basis point. I realized that this axis should not say euros because these are normalized spreads. I just got confused by that for a second. So half spreads are on average quite close to half a basis point. So which is estimated by the roll measure. So in our example at least, the roll measure is uh, fairly accurate, although it does not account for these outliers in the quota spread, which we do not really want to account for anyway. Yes. So this is how you... These are some of the instruments that you can use if you're missing some of the data that you actually need to estimate spreads. But spreads are not the only measure of illiquidity that you can use. So let us look at some of the other measures of liquidity or illiquidity or related uh, to that. So firstly, we talked about price depth as a concept which is very similar or possibly subsumed by the concept of liquidity and illiquidity. And you can measure price depth by the price impact coefficient. Price impact tells you pretty much exactly how does the mid quote change depending on the order size. So this is not a static concept. It does not tell you how deep a limit order book is in any given time, but rather it is a more dynamic concept. So it tells you if there was a large order imbalance in some given period, then the limit order book was probably depleted on that side. Right? So for example, there was 
um, a lot of buy orders in some given period. Then the ask side of the limit order book is quite depleted, meaning that the next ask is very high. This will affect the mid quote in the following period, right? So overall, the idea behind this is that a large a large buy order would lead to a higher mid quote in the next period, and vice versa. So this is the way to estimate a price impact coefficient. And if we do it in our case, you will get something like a 0.15 if you measure quantity in hundreds of thousands of uh, euro. But again, these are absolute terms. So you'll get that if you have um, 100,000 euros of trade imbalance in a given period, Or in this estimation, we actually go transaction by transaction. So if there was a 100,000 euro order, then the next period price will be uh, 15 euro cents higher or lower. And this does not tell us much if we do not actually recall that the price of the stock was about 3 euros around that time. Why do I keep saying euros? I believe this data is from a US stock exchange, probably in New York or NASDAQ. But I should really redo these graphs because they say euro. Oh well. So, okay, this is price impact. This is one measure you can use. Another measure is Hasbrook measure. Why do you need it? So, as you can see, this Hasbrook measure is almost exactly the same, but you measure the sensitivity of the price to trading volume rather than trading balance. So, trading volume is more or less the same variable if you look transaction by transaction, but it is unsigned. Right? So, here we do not see whether the trade size was, whether any given trade was a buy or a sell. And so you take uh, the price changes with an absolute value as well. So this Hasbrook measure can be useful when you do not actually know the directions of trade and you are not willing to employ the Lee Reedy algorithm to evaluate it. And for that particular reason, Hasbrook measure, I believe, is um, relatively popular in the real world. Another uh, distinction from the price impact coefficient is when you actually employ uh, these measures on aggregated data rather than on a transaction per transaction basis. Because then order imbalances are, do not necessarily scale up with the aggregation scope, while the volume actually does um, increase, obviously, with the period over which you are aggregating over. Therefore, depending on the level at which you aggregate, you will have very different estimate, estimates for this Hasbrook measure gamma. In our example, if you aggregate over all of the data, you'll obtain Hasbrook measure around 1.01. .01. A very related measure to Hasbrook is the Amihud measure of the liquidity. And what it does is instead of taking this linear uh, regression between changes in the mid quote and the trading volume, the Amihud measure takes their ratio. And this is pretty much it. Just a different functional form and uh, but the interpretation is for the most part the same. In our data set if you estimate the Amihud ratio measure by measure, you can see that it is pretty volatile and not particularly informative, but then again, you can estimate it using a more aggregated data. 
So you can use it as an average over some longer time intervals. Which I believe is the way that is that it is uh, typically used. Moving on, another measure that uh, you need to know about is volume weighted average price. And with this measure we are basically moving away from measuring market liquidity and moving more towards evaluating the performance. And here by performance I mean the performance of your broker who executes your order on your behalf. So when you call your broker you say I want to buy 100 stocks of that company. And the broker then um, has freedom in how they execute your order. They can just submit a market order for 100 stocks straight away. Or they can wait and split your order into smaller orders and so on. But at the end of the day you need to have some idea of how well the broker performed. And volume weighted average price is one benchmark that you can use. So this volume weighted average price is evaluated as just the average price of the transactions in a given period, usually in a given day, uh, weighted by their volume. So the name is pretty much self-explanatory. And the sum here is over transactions. You can also estimate it by taking the overall trading volume in a given day in the monetary value and divided by the number of traded stocks in a given day. This may be a simpler way to compute the volume weighted average price. Now why do we, why do you possibly care about the volume weighted average price? Well you can see it as the benchmark price as I mentioned. So you can compare the price that your broker got you with the volume weighted average price to see how how well the broker executed your order, how well the broker performed. Because if you ask the broker to buy stocks and uh, the broker got them at $50 a share, but you see that volume weighted average price in that day for that stock was at $43, that is when you realize that probably you need to find a new broker. So the problem in financial markets is finding the right benchmark to evaluate this performance, to understand what is expensive and what is cheap. And volume weighted average price gives you one possible anchor for that. Volume weighted average price is quite often used by uh, large institutional investors such as pension funds who are aiming to execute their trades with minimal price impact on the market and given that their trades are quite often significant in size this is a legitimate concern for them. Now volume weighted average price is not a perfect benchmark because it may depend excessively on a few orders. For example if the broker if the pension fund decided to sell 100,000 stocks of some company and it was the only trade in that day, or it was the half of trading volume in that day, then basically the any, any price that broker got them on that order would be pretty close to volume weighted average price. So it would be the price that they um, should have gotten. So Volume weighted average price is open to gaming, is subject to manipulation. And like any other measure, you can compute the volume weighted average price for our example and you will obtain something like um, something close to three dollars. As you could guess. Now, another measure that you can use to evaluate the performance of your broker of whoever executes your orders is the implementation shortfall. And this is very close to the story that I told you. So your goal at time zero is to purchase Q, some amount Q of stocks. This is the order that you give to your broker. And say that 
after time has passed, some time t, your broker managed to execute some fraction of the order, kappa, and the average price that you got is given by p bar t. Now, how much did you, how much did it cost you? How much did this transaction cost you compared to a perfectly liquid efficient market? So what is the cost of illiquidity? The actual gain from this transaction is kappa times q times, so the number of stocks that you got times the price gain on the current mid quote that you managed. So MT is how much these stocks are worth now at time T, once all is said and done. And P bar T is the average price at which you bought them. So this is this expression, kappa times Q times M minus P bar, is your net gain from the stocks that you managed to get. However, you could have gotten even more, presuming this M minus P bar is positive. If the trader has executed your order fully, so there is some opportunity cost to not having bought um, the stocks. Pardon me, that decomposition follows a little later. So this is your realized trading gain. Now your ideal trading gain would have been if your order was executed fully and at the mid quote that you expected to get at time zero, which was M0. So the maximal benefit that you could have accounted for is Q times MT minus M0. The implementation shortfall is basically the difference between the two. So how much you hope to get, Q times MT minus M0, minus the realized gain. And this is given by this expression right here. Now, the way you can rearrange it is to exactly split this shortfall into the loss from the price moving in unfavorable direction. So the actual price that you managed to get for your order was P bar T and the price that you hoped for was M0. So you probably lost some money if P bar moved in adverse direction compared to what you expected, if P bar T is worse than M0. So this is the execution loss on the purchase shares. And on the other hand, you have the opportunity cost from not having purchased the one minus kappa T share of stocks. And this opportunity cost is given by however the value of these stocks changed over time. So MT minus M0. So you can interpret the implementation shortfall as execution cost plus opportunity cost. Now you can calculate this uh, implementation shortfall in our example, but you would need to just accept some parameters or come up with some goal. And uh, for our story, we can say that suppose you want to buy 3,500 shares at the beginning of the trading day. And suppose that all of the buy orders that we observe in the data come from your broker. And among the first 30 transactions, there are 3,400 shares worth of buy orders. So these all came from you, meaning that your broker managed to almost fully execute your order across these first 30, well, 28 transactions. So what is the implementation shortfall in this problem? This is how you can plot it, and this is actually the ev evolution of this implementation shortfall over time. So the red line is uh, the total number of shares accumulated. 
So the total number of shares that you managed to buy by this point, and you can see that at the end it is close to 3400. And the green line is the actual implementation shortfall. The blue line is the mid price, and at this scale it just it's uh, not really easy to see the price changes. So we can uh, use the breakdown of the implementation shortfall that we just came up with into the execution cost and the opportunity cost. And they will look like this. So here the blue line is the total impl implementation shortfall. Red is the execution cost. So the difference between the price you got and the price you hoped for. And green is the opportunity cost. The loss from a price change on the stocks that you that you did not manage to buy. You can see that the opportunity cost is at the end very small, simply because almost all of your order managed to be filled by your broker. So all of the in implementation shortfall is accounted for by the execution cost, by the fact that you did not get the price that you expected for. So this is it for the execution measures. And uh, returning more broadly to measures of liquidity in general, there are many other measures that we have not talked about that you can use. For example, trading volume. It's pretty much self-explanatory. The more stocks are traded in the market, the more liquid this market is, just by definition because you have more trading opportunities in that market. Turnover rate, trade frequency are also used as uh, liquidity measures. And in general, you can use any of these or any of the other measures we considered. The trick is you have to use them cautiously because neither of them measure liquidity perfectly, simply because liquidity itself is not a very well-defined concept. In particular, some measures may contradict each other in some scenarios. <clears throat> For example, trading volume and spreads are both positively correlated with information releases. So whenever a firm, for example, issues its earnings report, the spread for its stocks increases, indicating that uh, its stocks became less liquid in that time, but trading volumes typically increase soon after these earnings announcements, which would suggest that uh, liquidity has increased if you, if you use trading volume as your liquidity measure. So here your conclusion about liquidity of the market de would depend on which measure you're using. Another example is uh, if you use price volatility as a measure of liquidity, then it is pretty bad measure, right? Because it is low in very liquid markets, because there the price is just very stable, and the market can easily absorb even the very large transactions. But price volatility is also very low in very illiquid markets, simply because there is no trade there, and the same prices, the same quotes, can hold for a very long time, for days, maybe even months, although that seems slightly less likely. If you are looking beyond the most liquid markets, if you're looking at some of the well, very illiquid markets, very thin markets, then you can um, use some other measure which would be more relevant, such as frequency of trading. Frequency of trading would be an acceptable measure when you simply do not have enough data to, ask to evaluate other measures. So when trading volume, for example, is zero for most uh, of the time in your sample, or ask and bid quotes are not quoted by anyone in that, for that asset. And simply no trades take place, so no realized prices are observed either. 
The takeaway here is that there are many, many, many different measures and they all measure slightly different things and all of them may be more or less useful depending on the data you have and depending on what exactly you're trying to use your quotes for on your final goal. Now this is it for today. So to summarize, we have talked about liquidity for all of today. We have talked about what it is and how to estimate it. And we saw that no measure, no method is perfect because they have different data requirements and they measure against slightly different things. And data shows that liquidity varies both continuously throughout a trading day and more abruptly around big events. So you should always be a little cautious about your estimates because they might be time specific. They might be very specific to the time in which your sample took place. So next week, in the next lecture, we will start analyzing what exactly drives the spread. What are the main determinants of illiquidity in the market? Finally, if you fill up to some exercises, then there are a few things you can do. Firstly, you can recreate all the graphs and figures and numbers I presented today. So basically, re evaluate all the measures of illiquidity using, for example, the full Krispy Kreme dataset that you can once again get on the companion website for the um, textbook. The textbook itself has a nice little exercise on the implementation shortfall. So if you're interested in that, you can have a look. Finally, the reading list for the course has one article on corporate bond markets. Corporate bond markets are slightly different from equity or stock markets, which are the thing that we are, or I at least, usually have in the back of my mind when I talk about financial markets. These are slightly different from corporate bond markets and there is a link to an article which describes how corporate bond markets work. So you can have a look at that and see how stock markets and bond markets differ in terms of liquidity and how this liquidity is affected by the market structures specific to these markets. This is all I have for today. Thank you and I will see you next week.